maintained its relevance over those hundred years. Obviously, this is something that's um, you know important for all official statistics. So hopefully, there's some uh, yeah lessons that we can all um, share together, um, and hopefully, we'll also point out some some interesting stories as well along the way. So the the chart that I've got up on the screen um, is highlights some of the changes to the CPI basket over the hundred years. Um, one, one way to think about the CPI is to picture um, a giant shopping basket or shopping trolley, and uh, we check the price of the, the items in that, in that basket. Um, and that basket is, you know, uh, has a selection of representative goods and services of all the things that households buy. And the, uh, the visual shows how the, uh, the coverage of the basket has uh, expanded over time. Um, We'll look at it in more detail, but right at the start, the, uh, it was just the basic things, uh, food, rent, and fuel and light. And then the coverage has gradually expanded over the years. Um, a lot of these early years, it's actually expanding coverage of the CPI, um, in terms of things it covers. And then in more recent years, um, it's continued to expand with uh, technological change. Um, yeah, so this is, this is one cut of the CPI basket. Another thing that we've done, uh, Nick will talk a little bit more about later on the website, is actually looking um, more in depth at a lot, lot more of the basket additions and, and removals as well. Um, and some of these are, are um, reflective of um, things that have become more or less popular in terms of, of household expenditure. So, carry on. Um, maybe I should just say, uh, give you a heads up as to what else is coming up. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the basket, as I said. Um, we'll also talk about the uses of the index and how that's um, changed over time and link that to yeah, how the, the scope and the, the methods of the index has um, evolved to, um, to reflect the changing uses. Um, we'll also take a look at the um, expenditure patterns in terms of the weighting of the CPI basket and um, yeah, highlight some of the stories that, the, um, that those expenditure patterns tell us. Um, we'll also take a quick look at um, price change over the, over the 100 years. And um, I'll hand over to um, uh, Nick uh, a little bit later. Uh, Nick's one of the cool kids of prices and uh, he'll show some of the more the more modern stuff and bring it up to date um, and also we'll take a bit of a look um, to the future as well as to what, what might be uh, coming up for the CPI in the near future. So this is, uh, this is the basket in, in 1914. Uh, this comes from a you know, I almost feel I need like, some white gloves to hold the original publication. This is uh, from the report of the cost of living, uh, 1891 to 1914. To me, this is a classic. It's a real the founding document of the, of the CPI in many ways. So this report um, so it goes back to 1891. Um, it was actually published in 1915. So basically, they've pieced together um, price change from retailers' historic records back to um, 1891. But then it also sets out the, um, the ongoing collection of prices going forward, um, which is why I guess we, we think this, you know, the CPI time series uh, starts in 1914. Because what happened from 1914 onwards was um, basically regional price collection in 25 um, towns around the country. Um, initially, it was the uh, inspectors of, of factories in each of the each of the regions, and. Um, that's the practice of you know people going into into shops to observe the prices, and that practice uh, continues today. But um, the price collection now is take, undertaken by Statistics New Zealand's own professional field force, um, and both then and now that that regional field collection is supplemented with um, additional additional collection direct from businesses. Um, so I'll read you a few quotes on this a little bit later. Um, a few th a few things uh, point out from the. From the, this original basket, as I said, it's just uh, it's got three food groups: um, rent or house rent, and uh, fuel and light. In that original report, um, the, the what they call the main inquiry didn't actually include the fuel and light, um, basically because because of the variation in in uh, use of different um, fuel and light across across the country. Uh, but it was available as a, as a special index um, with the food, rent, and fuel and light. Um, yeah, a couple of interesting things that <laughs> spring to my mind. Um, if you look at some of these quantities, like uh, flour and uh, sugar, they're uh, a 25 pound bag and a 56 pound <laughs> bag. Um, 
you know, quite a lot bigger than the, uh, the, the sizes we track today. Um, there's also uh, something in the index called blue. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. Laundry stuff. Yeah, laundry, yeah, laundry yeah. blue. Um, and, um, and another interesting thing is the fact that tobacco was in right from the start. So in the food group, they did have these few yeah, non, uh, non food groceries doing the laundry stuff and, and tobacco. One, one interesting uh, ex exception, given that the, uh, the initial focus was on um, sort of basic good, uh, goods, um, is the absence of clothing. And this is something that was actually talked about in the uh, report, and it was obviously quite a borderline thing whether or not to include clothing in the original, um, the original index. Let's read you a, a quote from that report. Clothing is a admitted necessity, but a large proportion of expenditure may well be looked upon as a luxury. It will be found that the average man of moderate income, the expenditure on clothing is to a great extent depending on what surplus of income is available after the needs of housing and food are satisfied. So you can see that um, yeah, clothing was uh, obviously on the, the borderline and um, it actually got added in 1924. And I'll, I'll explain a bit later, but the expanded baskets of 1924 and 1930 were actually worked back to 1914. And that's what's actually in our link to 100 years time series, is that expanded coverage. Skipping forward 100 years, this is the, uh, the basket today. Um, <coughs> this is uh, displayed as a tag flag. Um, so the, uh, the size of the words, or the font of the words, is in proportion to the, uh, the weights in the basket. There's actually uh, about 700 items in the, in the current CPR basket. And this is uh, displayed at a slightly more aggregated level. It's at um, what we call the class level, which is the lowest level where you publish price indexes at. And yeah, some interesting stories in there. First, I mean, the biggest one that pops out is rent. So that's still in, and still has a big weight. Um, uh, property, uh, some other housing things, property maintenance, uh, with decent sized weight, um, and uh, construction, which is, which is New housing, which is our measure of unoccupied housing, um, you can see they're quite big. Um, some other big ones, electricity, again in that field and light group, that's been included right from the start. Um, uh, petrol came in in 1955 with the inclusion of pri uh, private motoring, and yeah, one of the high, most highly rated single items in the current basket. And yeah, I guess the real sort of modern one is the telecommunication services, so that's your broadband and um, Cell phone services. Um, I think in the 1924 basket and since we've had some sort of uh, communication services, but obviously they're originally telegrams and postal services. Um, yeah, now we still have postal services, but with the um, yeah, there's more modern ones as well. Um, I mean, food is also another one that's obviously been in for the whole time series, um, broken down into some of the components at the class level, but. Um, yeah, it still has a, a decent chunk of the weight. We'll see the weights in a bit more detail as we, as we go on. <coughs> okay, so I'll focus a bit on this side because, um, like I said, I think the theme today was maintaining the relevance of the index. And in some ways, this is kind of a bit of a look behind the scenes at how we've done that. So it's um, a time going across the bottom, it's a timeline of. Um, yeah, different uh, uh, events. So the starting at the top, the um, the blue shows some of the, the approaches to um, to the index, and immediately underneath is the, the use of the index and how that's evolved over time. So initially, um, yeah, the focus was very much on the on the cost of living <coughs> for the purposes of uh, wage adjustments. Just off the off the sort of timeline, uh, back in eighteen ninety four. Um, was the Industrial Conciliation and Arbitration Act, which established the arbitration court. If you haven't heard of that, um, this court um, basically was the arbitrator between employers and employees in uh, wage negotiations, and basically they made determinations of the um, to do wage settlements. And yeah, so that was in uh, 1894, and um, another sort of Precursor to the, the start of the time series was the Royal Commission Inquiry into Cost of Living in 1912. And yeah, so the, the initial use of the index was very firmly um, cost of living and um, for the use of the arbitration court. 
um, from the, the 1914 report I showed you earlier, um, this, and this highlights, that's another quote, highlights the um, use as a cost of living index. It is said that the pinching show of rising prices has been at the, the root of much social discontent. To the average man, no subject is of greater interest than that which directly touches his pocket and modifies his spending power. The general level of prices, or the purchasing power of money, is an abstraction which in itself is mainly of academic interest. What touches everyone is the cost of living. So as we go on through time, so maybe I should have said that um, we've we linked it all together in what we call the 100 year CPI time series, but um, as it was known at the time at the start, was it, it was known as the Retail Prices Index, or the Government Statisticians Retail Price Index. And in 1942, um, this was superseded by the Wartime Prices Index, which um, came about due to some emergency legislation of the war. And in 1942, the government announced its intention to stabilise prices of essential commodities and services. And the plan was twofold. Uh, one was to have a price control plan, uh, where they limited price increases for certain goods and services, but also to use the Wartime Prices Index to automatically adjust wage and salary rates. And yeah, just, just for the context of the 100 years time series as well. So that's the wartime price index was used from 42 um, until 49. And, but the government statistician's retail price index was continued to be calculated. And in the linked time series, it's the government statistician's retail price index, which is the one that, we, uh, that we've got in there. And then uh, <coughs> 1948 was the first of the, of the uh, many CPI advisory committees. And this really widened the, the coverage of the uh, index. And I won't go into too much of the technical details in terms of the different approaches, in terms of the use approach, the expenditure approach, and the acquisition approach. The main difference is in terms of the treatment of housing. Um, but what I do want to point out is the link between those and the uses, and how the uses have expanded over time, and that's led to the, the changes in those approaches. So, yeah, initially, from the Start from 1948 was a use approach, which is yeah, very much aligned again with that cost of living, a wage adjustment approach. But gradually, uh, the CPI became more and more of a macroeconomic indicator. The uh, 1971 advisory committee said that the CPI should be a general purpose price index. And the 78 committee it continued to affirm the general purpose nature of the CPI. And uh, that committee noted the historical principle use of the CPI was to adjust wages, but the emphasis had widened to include the use of the index as a general inflation measure and for far-reaching economic policy decisions affecting the whole community. So you can see that yeah, the use is gradually expanding, and yeah, that led to a change to the to an expenditure approach um, in uh, '75, which also coincided with. Um, a recommendation from the 1971 advisory committee was to um, establish an ongoing uh, household budget survey, um, initially known as the household survey, uh, mm -hmm. now known as the household economic survey, and um, that's recently celebrated 40 years. Um, and yeah, so that was also related to the alignment to the expenditure approach, which, or the payment approach, which is um, what's used as sort of the underlying con concept for the household economic survey. And then in more recent years, um, uh, 1989 uh, was sort of the Reserve Bank Act, um, which came into, came into effect in 1990. And um, as most of you know, this, this uh, with, the, with the policy target agreements, uh, tar targets keeping inflation between a certain range. Initially, um, this was between 0 and 2%. And which was widened in '96 to between 0 and 3 percent, and from September 2002, the range is now um, between 1 and 3 percent. And so that's the yeah the monetary policy uh, use coming in. And in uh, 1999, uh, uh, interest was removed from the, C the CPI uh, basket, and that was to align it more with that with the monetary policy. Aspect and from the 1997 advisory committee onwards, the um, official principal use of the CPI has been for monetary policy, but acknowledging all the other uses of the index as well. 
Yes, yeah, so I've talked a bit about these advisory committees. I think that's one of the key ways that um, you know, the index has um, evolved you know, in a useful way over time. And the other thing that's running behind all this is the international context. And I mean, advisory committees are recommended by um, international guidance. There's also, um, I mean, currently there's the uh, ILO, the International Labour Organization's uh, Resolution on Consumer Price Indexes, uh, most recent version. 2003, and there's also a CPI international manual, which helps uh, provide advice on different methods and things. And of course, um, we've had we always, I mean, since the beginning of the time series, there's always been comparison with other countries. Even that 1914 report um, yeah, compares the New Zealand situation with other countries, including Australia and Great Britain. Um, and in Sort of even more often than the advisory committees is this updating the weights and baskets, and I'll show some of the um, expansion patterns in just a second. Um, so yeah, that, not, that initial um, basket in 1914 um, had these growing coverage ones in 1924 and 1930, and the um, extra coverage, uh, different coverage for the wartime price index in 1942, but. In the 100 years time series, it's the 1930s expenditure rates that are actually all for the first, that first sort of 35 years. And then yeah, you can see the regular um, updates. One of the things you can kind of notice is the dots are getting closer together, so we update the basket more often now, um, approximately once every three years. And the next, yeah, the next weight update is due for later this year, and Nick will say a little bit more about that later. Um, yeah, finally on this slide, <laughs> For me, I don't think you can have a seminar on history of the CPI without mentioning household budget surveys, because I think they, they, do, they go hand in hand. Um, I guess a lot of people I mean, they might not realise about some of these earlier um, budget surveys, but they're actually used to weight the, uh, the early index. Um, one thing that's interesting, you might be able to see two well on the slides, you might see on the handout, handout is the uh, sample size of these early surveys, and it's pretty small. Um, there's 69, 69 households uh, responding to that, that first survey. Um, and yeah, similarly, the low, sort of 109, 318, and 250 is some size for all these other earlier ones. Um, this survey, uh, 38 39, was um, limited just to cover uh, Chan Raymen and British operatives, and was uh, run uh, by the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. These middle two, were run by the uh, Census and Statistics Department, and the early one was a Department of Labour survey. And yeah, this Department of Labour survey, despite its small sample size, was actually used to weight that 1914 um, basket, and yeah, the 1930 one for the 1913, um, and the two together for the uh, wartime price index in 1942. Um, the weighting of the 49 and 65 are the only two exceptions where. Um, uh, Household budget survey wasn't used in terms of the weights. That was just from um, national accounts uh, data and um, uh, surveys or censuses into distribution. The 1955 uh, weight update was partly based on a PSA, Public Service Association, a household budget survey, run in 52 and 53. And then, yeah, underlying all the sort of the more recent ones after the introduction of the household economic survey, that's been the underlying. Um, basis for the weighting, but we also use um, other data sources as well. So <laughs> just by just to say something a little bit more about these early um, budget surveys with their small sample sizes. I, I remember when I was looking at these and thinking, you know, as a professional statistician they didn't think you know, the best and I sort of thought, oh how can I politely say something about them? It's okay, I don't need to because I can quote the 1948 committee labelled the early attempts at budget surveys as uniformly disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> so these surveys all suffered from low response rates and consequently small sample sizes. And the report gave a frank account of the problems encountered. It said, while the national virtues and spending habits were generously represented in the family budgets received, the national vices were curiously absent. <laughs> and that committee um, outlined the key features that they constituted, uh, considered constituted a properly designed family budget inquiry conducted by modern standards to include interviews conducted by skilled enumerators of randomly selected uh, families. So they certainly knew at the time what they needed to be doing, but they didn't necessarily have the, uh, you know, the re resources they needed to, to go and do it until um, yeah, 1973 was the start of the House of Economics. So. 
moving on to the, the weighting patterns. Um, I think the, these patterns, to me, um, they really tell a story in terms of um, you know, some of the social and economic development of New Zealand over the time. And I mean, I'll just point out a few, but I think there's, there's plenty more stories to come out. And some of these stories, and the price term stories, I should say, um, are already uh, available on the website in terms of the price index news. If people aren't aware of that, um, go and have a look at that. And um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be more stories coming out through that. So, I mean, some of the, uh, the stories that, uh, point that stand out to me for this is um, particularly the food and the, this decreasing weight on food over time. And um, the, but the expansion of um, restaurant meals, this is the takeaways um, sort of coming in. Uh, actually came in in 49, and then you can see the weight increasing towards the end. Um, another one, rent, I showed earlier that's uh, been in the index for the whole 100 years. But other uh, measures of housing have, have come in. Um, 1949 saw um, yeah, other housing costs, including um, things like household maintenance. And then um, 1975, with that changing conception of like, Introduced the um, construction of new dwellings as a measure of owner occupied housing. And initially, that had um, the mortgage interest payments was also included in the scope, but that um, you know, dropped out in 99. Um, what else? Fuel, uh, fuel and light, um, now called household energy in the, in the yellow, it's been there the whole time, um, sort of a decreasing weight and then popping back up again at the end. Uh, clothing, pretty clear. Um, decline in, uh, in importance in the basket over, over that period. And then some of these other things expand New York transport um, just you know, exploded. In 1955, I said, was um, when private motoring was first introduced. Um, initially, the transport was um, just train and tram fares. And then um, you had know, private motoring and bus fares came in. And um, a petrol came in with the private motoring in 1955. And uh, airfares in 1975. I'm quite certain because the weight's so small, but uh, by the later ones, you can see what uh, the weight of airfares um, becoming reasonable. Um, yeah, then then that expansion of other or miscellaneous. Um, some of the, the ones you can really see popping out at the end there are um, education and health. So that's just households' direct expenditure on those, you know, not including what's provided by the state. Um, and the explosion in the, the sort of the recreation area, so that includes the things like um, consumer electronics and going to sporting events and concerts and um, packaged holidays, things like that. So. Just to kind of put things together a bit more, um, using some of those old historic reports, I put an estimate of coverage of household expenditure by the, the CPI. So, you can see that some of those patterns were just due to the growing scope of the CPI, um, but some of them are um, probably, most of those stories I pointed out are actually true in the, in the expenditure weights themselves, or sorry, the expenditure patterns themselves, like including um, all, all the things that uh, have like spent the money. What's the excluding section in the upper left, once it's supposed to be described? Um, you mean from right at the end of 1975 onwards? Or? No, 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 prior oh, to 1975. I mean, these are things like, I mean, for example, in this 1914, um, the things like clothing and transport not been in there, but they were in the budget survey, so, no. yeah. And so, think, yeah, so things like the, the coverage increasing between 49 and 55 is the inclusion of private motoring and alcohol. I'm going to push on to the, the, uh, <laughs> the fruits of our labour, the, uh, the price change series. Um, I should have said as well at the start, um, last week we published quite a few things on the, on the website which uh, Nick's going to highlight, um, basically you know, in celebration of the 100 years of CPI, and one is looking at the price change in a bit more detail, another one is looking at the basket change in more detail. And another thing we've done is um, a lot of these historic reports where we've got this information from have been um, digitised and they're now available on the web as well, so um, take a look at those. So just have a look at the early price increase. Um, see, 
uh, this, this is from the um, publication in 1997, Inquiry into Palestinian Zones. And it's, um, it's linking from 1907 uh, onwards. So prior to 1914, um, that, that 1914 basket was actually collected, but only in the four main centres. So that's what um, this is showing, the four main centres. And you can see that the yeah, prices were really shot up after 1914. Uh, Another really interesting reference to people interested in this sort of early history is um, about the arbitration court. And um, it's put by James Holt, compulsory arbitration in some of the first 40 years. And it gives a lot more of the, you know, the context. Um, just to give you a quote about this, this sort of initial price rise. Uh, James Holt says, it soon became apparent that the major economic problem affecting labor in the war years would not be unemployment and depression, but price inflation. And, um, Quoting from his source, um, price increased 34% in the, in the four years to March 1918. And he said, though not astronomical by the standards of more recent times, the book was written in the 1970s, inflation of this order was a totally new experience for the generation it afflicted and led, not surprisingly, to demands for compensatory increases in wage rates. So moving on to just take a look at the some of the other sort of interesting pictures in the rest of this. Um, yeah, there's, periods, there's these periods of de deflation. Um, this one here, um, sort of five years to 1934, was coincided with the Great Depression. <coughs> and prices fell 20% over that period. Um, I, think, I think I promised on the, uh, on the, uh, the blurb that there was uh, deflation, inflation, and uh, hyperinflation. So, and there's inflation through the throughout the whole lot. The actually average inflation over the whole period was 4.4% annually. And um, one of the periods closest to that is actually the 1950s, the Spanish, so the big peaks. Um, in the 1950s, that average um, annual inflation. is 4.9%. Uh, and I don't know what your definition of hyperinflation is, but <laughs> What was happening in the 70s and 80s was pretty, uh, pretty high inflation for me. Um, the prices in the, in the 70s more than tripled, and in the 80s prices nearly tripled. Um, in 1973, there was the first oil price shock, and Britain joined the European Economic Community. Uh, meat and dairy exports were subject to quota limits. And there's another oil price shock later in the 70s. Um, there's a little dip here around uh, 82. This was, um, there was a wage and price phase that started in 82 until 84, um, and had a tem temporary effect. And then in the more, the more recent years, I said about the Reserve Bank Act coming into effect in 1990, um, and yeah, those policy target premiums. Um, and I think it's price stability of the question mark, maybe, but um, yeah, some of, uh, the most recent sort of blip up was the increase um, in GST in, in 2010. This little decrease here was um, interest rates coming down, but then uh, interest rates were removed from the policy in 1999. Um, average inflation since 1990 has been 2.2%, uh, so a lot lower than uh, in some of the earlier years. With that, I'll pass over to Nick, who uh, can restore it. <coughs> All right, thanks, Alan. So, I'm just doing quite a uh, comprehensive look at the past. Um, so I'm going to concentrate more on the future and what, what, you may, uh, what we might expect from the next hundred years. So what we've got here are a couple of what we call uh, infographics. So these are two of the first infographics that we, um, that we did. Um, basically what an infographic is, it's just a, well for us it's just a, a more fun way of presenting um, stories to the price change. Uh, so this first one here looks at the price of new cars. Um, so you're probably aware that um, over time the, the various different features in cars have gotten um, more advanced. Um, and this infographic sort of looks at how we, we treat that um, the increase in what we call quality uh, in the CPI. Um, the second infographic here looks at uh, haircuts, which have um, been in the CPI for quite a while. 
Um, it looks at the, the, the changing cost of a haircut, but it also sort of highlights some of the changing styles as well. Haircuts, so it's a bit of a, um, bit of a, uh, I think it's a story that sort of links into some of the stuff Alan mentioned earlier. This next infographic here um, looks at the cost of a typical Christmas barbecue using um, items that we track with the CPI. Um, it compares prices in 2002 to 2012. And the next one here, again telling a similar story to um, what you've just seen, um, looks at some of the, the changes in <coughs> gadgets um, over time since the 1940s and 50s when we had little um, from radios and um, records uh, right up to tablets and mm -hmm. three players and things like that. And this infographic here looks at bananas, one of, uh, one of the more popular fruits consumed by New Zealanders. Um, so it compares the, the cost of banana, well, the, the relative spending of bananas um, compared to other fruits like uh, apples and oranges. Um, also looks at where we import our bananas from and how that's changed over time uh, and throws in a bit of a comparison with um, Australia and the, the cost of a banana in New Zealand relative to Australia. Um, so another um, way that we can present our, uh, begin to present our data um, is through this uh, interactive time series. Um, we released this product uh, uh, as part of our 100 years of CPI celebration. Um, and basically what this does is it, it takes the CPI time series and divides it up into five separate um, chunks and provides a little bit of commentary around what was happening with the price change. Um, so what you can see, I'll give a bit of a demonstration. Um, there's these buttons at the top and you can click on each button and it'll sort of just sort of cycle you through the time series like, uh, as so. And it just um, provides a bit of context around some of the movements and what was happening at the time. Um, another product we released uh, as part of the 100 years of CPI celebration is our interactive um, basket. So what this looks like uh, looks at is the um, goods and services that were added and removed from the CPI basket over time. Um, quite similar to the previous product, you can click on the different um, the different uh, categories at the top. So looking at food here, you can see um, a few of the, like for example, we have uh, things like um, Sago and tapioca being removed from the basket in 1949. Uh, Two-minute noodles added in 2002, things like that. Um, and you can click on different things, and this is looking at um, uh, goods and services related to home, so things like paint and toasters and clothes dryers and things like that. So um, definitely encourage you guys to go and have a look at those, have a bit of a play around and you might find some interesting stories, um, particularly in this last category here, which we call Really, um, <laughs> and that looks at some of the more quirkiest things that have um, gone in and out of the CPI basket, so things like water beds and uh, wine coolers. <coughs> so this next one here, I'll actually, I'll actually have a bigger, bigger demonstration of this. This is um, what we call our Daily Pie visualisation, and again this is on the website. Um, basically what you've got here is you've got CPI, and you've got CPI divided in, into all the different categories. So we just hover over one of the categories, you can see here, we've got food. What it shows is um, how much prices have changed over a certain period. So at the moment, we're looking at um, the latest quarter of the CPI. But what I can do is uh, drag this down here, and you can look at how what we're looking at here is how prices have changed since um, the June quarter in 2006. Basically what this all means is the, the length of each sort of uh, slice of the pie um, represents how much prices have changed and the width of the slice 
um, represents its relative weight within the index. Um, so you also get a bit of a, um, a bar graph here that shows the, the quarterly movements um, for each of the groups. Now, that's not all. What you can do also do is drill down into each group and look at the various subcomponents in each group. So here we're looking at food, and we can hover over something like grocery food, get a bit of an idea of how prices for grocery food have changed, and we can drill down even further and look at some of the various subcomponents of grocery food. So we've got breads and cereals, milk, cheese and eggs, and so on. Now, if I zoom out, what we can do is um, watch how CPI prices have changed over time. So we push play down in the corner here, and it sort of gives a bit of a, um, a demonstration like that. So it's a pretty cool tool. Um, you can also check that one out on our website as well, and I would definitely encourage you to have a play around with that. Okay. This is just a backup presentation. Okay. So some of the other things that, are, um, that we're currently working on at the moment. Um, so Ellen talked a little bit about advisory committees. Um, we had our latest CPI advisory committee in 2013. Um, and basically what an advisory committee is, is, a, is a, uh, an independent um, committee made up of uh, um, people who sort of represent the CPI user community. Um, they've made 16 recommendations that um, confirm um, current practice, but also recommend new initiatives. Some of these new initiatives that the committee recommended are things like uh, moving the CPI to a monthly frequency, uh, providing um, price indexes for different groups of households, um, looking at price indexes for different regions of uh, in New Zealand at a single point in time, so that measure the different price levels. Um, things like that, and we're looking to um, release a, uh, a decision paper um, in the coming weeks that will sort of look at uh, which of those recommendations we will be um, taking forward. Uh, another thing um, that everyone's talking about at the moment is big data. So um, big data means um, a few different things for um, CPI. Um, firstly, uh, consumer electronics. So we um, are able to obtain data from an external company uh, called GFK who collect information, um, what we call scanner data, which is essentially when you go to a shop and say you buy a TV and they scan it through, um, the, the various retailers will send that data through to GFK who will compile all sorts of information about um, what was purchased, so it's um, various characteristics. Um, and basically it's quite, a, it's, a, it's quite a rich source of information and can be used to, um, to create quite accurate price indexes. Um, we're looking to implement um, price measures using this data in the, the next quarter, um, the September 2014 quarter CPI, um, using methods that uh, have been developed by our um, senior researcher, Francis, and uh, with help from uh, a colleague uh, from Stats Netherlands, um, Jan de Haan. And um, we'll be among one of the first countries in the world to, um, to use these methods uh, for consumer electronics. Um, another area where we are looking to uh, do this is with um, supermarkets as well, so uh, information on the various different groceries that households buy. Um, other areas of big data that we're exploring um, is uh, what one is uh, price scraping. Essentially what price scraping is, is a, uh, a tool that um, goes to various different websites on the internet, collects price information and then uh, that we can then use to aggregate into a, a price index. Um, we're working with the Billion Prices Project which is run out of MIT over in the States um, to, to sort of get that up and running. Um, and then another area uh, to do with big data is um, what we call sample of bills and what this is is um, uh, service providers will provide us with samples of their customers bills that have been anonymised um, 
and we can use these bills to measure price change for quite uh, more complex services. So things like telecommunication services where you've, you, you might have, say, a cell phone and internet package bundled in together. Uh, Alan also talked um, about CPI reviews or CPI reweights um, and mentioned that the, the latest uh, review of the CPI um, will be implemented in the September quarter, uh, September 2014 quarter. So that will be uh, released on the 23rd of October this year. Um, what this review will entail is, a, is a, the latest update to the CPI basket and also um, an update to the relative importance or the weights of the items in that basket. Um, and we've also been working with um, Charlene Forbes and Anton Victorio on a uh, book um, called The New Zealand CPI uh, at 100, History and Interpretation. Um, and this book will be uh, is having its official launch on the 29th of July. Um, so it should be a good read and I encourage you all to pick it up. Um, so I believe that is it. Yep, so um, we'd like to open the floor to any questions that you may have um, now. I was just wondering, you talked about a difference in um, the items in the basket and yep. taking them out. Is mm -hmm. that the advisory committee that determines that or some other process? Okay, so that's done as part of the CPI reviews. So the, um, basically they happen every three years um, and that's just carried out by us. So that's um, what Alan and I are and um, a few others in our team are working on at the moment. And the basket and weight updates, you know, that move to the three yearly, what, yep. what's determined that, what's, why does it regulate out? Right, so there's a recommendation by the um, International Labour Organisation, or ILO, um, which basically says you should uh, reweight your uh, CPI um, at least once every five years. So international practice is to do it within um, five years, and so we're well within that range. Um, but basically it's been shown that if you don't reweight the, um, the basket um, very frequently then they can become biased because those expenditure weights get out of date. Um, and when, and when, when they're biased, what we call a substitution bias, um, they, can, they tend to overstate um, expenditure and that can mean things like um, governments uh, they, uh, indexing payments by more than what, what they should be doing and it can, so it can, cause, can create a cost to government if the uh, indexes aren't reweighted frequently. In the New Zealand context, um, internationally, is there um, any distinct ways that our basket of goods differs to, um, for instance, European basket, CPI basket? I think, I think one of the big things is probably second-hand cars, oh, okay. uh, because we import a lot from Japan. Yeah. Um, We've also got I mean, a few food things like having uh, taro and kumo in the, in the basket as well. Yeah. yeah. Housing equipment as well. Yes. Yeah. So the way we treat housing, yeah, it varies internationally, so we're quite close to how Australia deal with housing, and then if you look at places like um, United States and Canada, the, the treatment of housing aligns with um, when, when Alan mentioned the, the use concept, um, which is more looking at cost of living type um, indexes and European Union. I don't think they've decided how they're measuring housing at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely it's a, it's a, a hotly debated topic in uh, international yeah. pricing depth surfacing. Yeah. Yeah. Another one, I've got to say thanks very much. That was a Just a, you said that um, the, you're looking at doing a CPI based on different household mm -hmm. types. Got any? Mm -hmm. so, so you'll do a different weight for different household types. Yep. Yeah, so there's a fe feasibility study. So Alan, you might want to talk about it since you did it. Um, yeah, we made the fun, for the for the uh, most recent advisory committee in 2013. We did a feasibility study um, looking at you know, basically using the household economic survey for different different groups. Um, and then reweighting the basket based on those different weighting patterns. Um, so that's all probably available on the stats website. So let's have a look at that. Um, yeah. So I guess 
in some ways, that's where we're, that's where we're at, um, and the, yeah, the advisory committee recommendation um, basically was to was to develop those. Um, yeah, and then so our, our response to those advisory committee recommendations, yeah, a couple, a couple of times, I think. Possible, possible household types. Yeah, I mean, some of the, the <coughs> most likely based on the. Oh, maybe I should say as well, we've, we've had a public consultation on the advisory committee recommendations as well, um, which was run earlier this year. Um, and based on feedback from that, looking like the most likely ones um, to initially go forward will be uh, looking at income quintiles, um, five income group, groupings, um, also um, superannuations and beneficiaries, uh, two separate ones there, and a CPR for Maori households as well. What does it mean that interest is no longer in the basket? Does that mean mortgage payments, interest on mortgage payments isn't in the basket? Yeah. Okay. But rent payments, which would then be passed on to as mortgage interest payments by their landlords, that is being captured. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's and the same for any business as well. It's like, I mean, that's, I guess, intermediate consumption for business, the landlord being the business in that sense, or like any shop that might have interest payments or anything like that. It but it's the cost of the household, though. The rental payment is the cost of the household. The mortgage payment is the cost of the household. But one, you count it, and the other, you don't, even though in both cases it's yeah. going to service a mortgage. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the main reason why it's excluded is um, it's aligned with um, uh, the approach, the acquisition approach. And the reason for aligning with that is for the, yeah, the uh, principal use, which is for the monetary policy. And basically, if, if we included interest in that, and that was the target for um, the Reserve Bank, so they may change the ACR, but it ends up being cyclical because that they change interest rates, which changes the CPI. So that's why they don't. Why, for that purpose, you don't want interest in the in the target. Wouldn't you still see if we had a ninety percent rental market, like a very small number of owner-occupied houses, then that would still happen because rent would go up with interest. It would happen if the landlords choose to put their rent up in response to the interest. So, well, wouldn't they? Oh, so well, I, think that I guess there's a choice. Like, yeah, I think I mean, choice, rent's yeah. a particular example, but I think it was actually yeah. happening in a lot of goods and services. If, yeah. if interest went through the roof, then businesses would have to recoup that cost and it would come through um, yeah, in those other goods and services as well. As well. No, not necessarily as directly, but yeah. Just suggest you explain what is counted in terms of home ownership and the current CPI and also what would be in the, um, in the subpopulation indexes if we go ahead for those. Yep. Um, so, yeah, currently in terms of owner occupied housing, um, it's just the you know, uh, additions to the housing stock um, to the household sector. So that's you know, total new builds that are built by owner occupiers, but also any um, shift in or out between owner occupiers and um, landlords. So that's the, the you know, new dwelling or construction part. We've also got um, property maintenance is in there, um, and um, things like local authority rates and water and utilities. And so that, um, yeah, so that's the main current approach which aligns with the acquisition framework. For the subpopulation price indexes, um, based on the recommendations from the advisory committee, um, we'll be looking to develop those on a payment um, framework. So that's um, more, you know, basically what's the cash out pays of the household. So that would then include interest for those, um, but wouldn't include the new dwellings um, because under that framework, they're treated as a, as a capital asset. So there's also some differences between those approaches of what you do with interest as well. Um, in, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, interest, insurance as well. Um, yeah, related to, the, related to those concepts. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, There's, there's actually more, uh, heavy, heavy interest in this, that again, in that, um, the work we've done for the 2013 advisory committee, um, in the particular paper about, well, actually, in the first chapter, and also in the chapter about subpopulations, we explain these frameworks in more detail and why we include all the next thing. Uh, yeah, I'll try and I'll try and remember. So it's chaired by Diana Crossan. 
who was the um, ex retirement commissioner and now uh, CEO of Wellington Free Ambulance. We had um, John McDermott from Zed Bank, um, Stephen Summers from Business New Zealand, um, Carla Hukamo, she's a, um, an academic in Auckland. Um, a couple of academics we had, um, Marco Rial from University of Waikato. Uh,